of all organizers i welcome you all to this third session in the win watson webinar series 2020 i am paresh vora i am director india operations win foundation india as a as a diverse geography people and culture and as a range of water and sanitation challenges of course the world itself world also has a, race, a range of such challenges across several countries this requires thousands of innovations to be trialed refined adopted and implemented in technology and products processes and protocols delivery and business models further ground level empowerment uh, of local communities of local officials whether managerial and technical skilling is required to enable communities and other stakeholders to adopt these innovations and often also mix them with traditional methods to meet needs of a modern society these webinars aim to showcase leading on ground innovative projects as also spur discussions and collaborations among diverse stakeholders and most importantly take such innovations to the communities to improve their quality of life this series has been jointly organized by some of the leading institutions and social organizations in this domain uh, namely iit kharagpur the oldest iit whose school of environment sciences and engineering works on economical and effective engineering solutions for environmental issues erit communities and technologies whom we heard last time a leading organization working on participatory groundwater management in some of the toughest arid and saline regions sept university amdavad uh, today's session organizers and internationally renowned architecture and town planning university whose center for water and sanitation has implemented the pioneering performance assessment system for water and sanitation service delivery in over 900 cities across six states iit bombay another leading iit whose center for technology alternatives for rural areas has enabled its faculty and students to apply many technologies to rural settings in watson health energy and so on iit gandhinagar a dynamic young iit with innovative approach to curriculum and research whose center for sustainable development is taking up challenges in several domains including water and sanitation and win foundation a young not for profit foundation focused on innovations for sustainable social impact in the twin domains of water and sanitation and maternal and child health we all without any further delay welcome to today's session and i'll hand over uh, to dr dinesh mehta professor emeritus and joint director center for water and sanitation sept university to take the session further dr mehta has over 45 years of experience Uh, and has uh, served in many many leading uh, positions, including the dean of SEPT, SEPT, and uh, several other positions in India as well as abroad. Over to Dr. Mehta. Thank you, Arish Bai, and thank you to the Win Foundation for inviting us to join this webinar series. Uh, we have been working very closely with the win foundation in terms of looking at various innovations that are being supported by them and the work that cwas is doing in terms of on water performance assessment is something that has become innovative and that is something that we would like to showcase today we also have a panel of eminent researchers scholars practitioners so the plan for this webinar is that we will have a presentation from our cwas colleague and then we will have uh, our panelists reflect on this but also reflect from their own experiences so and we have panelists from all over from lisbon and south africa from stockholm and from delhi so the the idea of the whole uh, session today is to look at the issues of water issues of measuring performance of utilities or water suppliers and also ensure that how the water service is delivered to the needy Uh, or to the uh, consumers both 
efficiently and as we are saying in the title equitably so i would like to first introduce our my colleagues uh, dr meera mehta uh, meera has been working in the water sector for the last i think 20 30 years she has uh, worked with the usaid's fire project where she innovated the municipal bond and uh, financing water utilities in india and elsewhere she worked with the world bank's water and sanitation program in and then with the world bank in india and in africa so she has a wide experience of the water sector she is on the board of many international organization one of them is where uh, ruchika is associated with the irc and she was on the gwp the global water partnership and others so uh, and our other colleague uh, jaladi wawalia she has been working with the cwas for the last 10 years she has been handling the performance assessment system project uh, leading that activity and as uh, we said in the introduction that we started with 400 cities in the two states of india and today we are now into 1000 cities and hopefully we are talking in conversation with the government so it can become 1500 to 4000 depending upon how our conversations go so what we would like to i would like to hand over to meera and jaladi for their presentation and then we will uh, come back to the panelists so over to meera thanks viresh if i can request rahul organizers to put the presentation on what i'm what i'll do is to talk little bit about the performance assessment system the project of the activity how we started and how it has developed over a period of time and what we have managed to achieve so far so we we were actually as dinesh said we were in africa for some time uh, in fact both of us worked in the urban sector during the 90s before we went to africa and there was very little that happened in terms of government investments in the water sector in the urban sector in india next slide next slide rahul uh but in 2005 government of india actually introduced a major program the jawala nehru mission and which actually put a lot of funding in the sector when we came back uh, to india in 2008 we found that there was a lot of infra infrastructure investments that were being made in the sector lot of water treatment plants were being built sewerage lines were being laid stps were being built but nobody seemed to be talking about whether service improvements were taking place and this is something that sort of uh, gave us the idea that it would be good to introduce a system of service monitoring which will enable the governments the local governments themselves the state government national government to monitor performance of the infrastructure that was being laid and whether actual services were being developed or not or were being delivered or not so we said what what kind of performance measurement can we introduce or can we think of in the context of india uh, there was not much that had happened in india what was had been done was isolated attempts here and there of looking at 20 cities 30 cities now what we looked at was a little bit beyond uh, india and we looked at in fact iws performance uh, assessment framework which elena will talk about later and we actually got guidance from them but then we realized that even if we are very technically sound it is very important that the framework that we talk about and the system that we introduce has to be grounded in the realities of the country and therefore nationally owned we therefore looked up uh, 
engaged with the national government next slide and ensured that what we were talking about was not going to be an isolated research activity but something that the government can actually also take up luckily for us this was a time that government of india also actually was deliberating on what they referred to as service level benchmarks what has come to be known as slbs and which was very much aligned with the thinking that we had in terms of performance assessment system so we joined with government of india system we added a few things as i'll talk later but the whole point was that although we can develop this kind of a system whether there was data at the local level to monitor this kind of a activity or not now that was a question that and we had a couple of partners that we worked with and we found that in fact when we visited in gujarat and maharashtra the two states where we actually take, took up this activity state wide so about 400 cities or so we went to all the our, with our partners we went to all the ulbs and then we found that in fact data does exist and you can see in the photos here that everybody had all these files in their offices where data was there next slide but obviously this data was not very useful by itself unless we converted that data into something that is actually usable now here we partnered with tata consultancy services tcs to deliver through a academic business partnership and we developed an online platform uh, and we refer to this as a pass e platform which is now being operational and then we developed a system wherein a lot of validation checks are inbuilt into the system that we have developed next slide so this is now something that is operational and it is very user friendly for the local governments and it's easy for them to operate in that what we have done is with our partners again both urban management center and all india institute of local self governments ailsg we work to build capacity of local governments to use this platform efficiently and over time you can see in the graph that initially it took almost one and a half years for us to actually get the data convert it into the kind of system that we are talking about over four year period of time it was reduced to two months and these days in fact urban local governments are able to operate this system and uh, measure their performance over a period of one or two weeks actually so that is a kind of system that has become possible next slide now using this we have also next slide we have also developed it is important that it doesn't again still remain only data you know previous slide previous slide rahul yeah so it become it's important that the analysis becomes possible reviews by local governments themselves become possible the data entry process is very user friendly so those are things that have been done there is city performance that can be measured each city can measure its own performance and it can compare itself with their counterparts in the state in the other states and so on so that is the user friendly nature of the system that has been developed now next now interestingly although we started working with the governments and i must say that this is a something that was a very ambitious task that we when we started we started as i said two states gujarat and maharashtra with 400 cities and we have to give our thanks to bill and melinda gates foundation because they actually put faith in us it was for the first time that they were funding an agency outside of europe and us directly for their wash program and they put faith in us to take this not only experimental but at scale and this is something that has worked but interestingly the although our government agencies are certainly the main users that we had envisaged what we found now is that a large number of other users financial institutions uh, some of the fis who came to gujarat for example for their monitoring they said we first look at past data to make sure that we are aware of what is happening a large number of researchers are using that students academicians 
regulators, CAG, state technical boards, they are all using, and of course, consultants who are also using. So there is, this is happening to a wide scale. Next slide. Now, we have sustained this over a period of time. Last year, in fact, we celebrated 10 years of pass, and it's something that's still ongoing and actually not only ongoing, but growing. We benefited a lot from uh, sort of performance, uh, performance link grants or incentives that were given by 13th and 14th finance commissions in India because they made it mandatory for local governments to do this and publish their data. And this actually has been ex extremely useful. And state governments also find it very useful to have this kind of data on their services. Next slide. And I'll stop with that, that interestingly, as you can see on the left are Gujarat and Maharashtra, those who are familiar with India. We started in those two states and we were told that you can do anything in Gujarat and Maharashtra because those are advanced states. But we have now grown across India, five more states where this is happening. And they are, uh, in fact, sometimes even doing better than in terms of uh, managing the data than Gujarat and Maharashtra. As Dinesh said, we now have 100 smart cities where it is happening. And the plan, we are currently in discussion to take it countrywide uh, through 500 extra cities, as well as if it works then countrywide across all cities. So that is something that we feel has been extreme success. I think that's next. And I think uh, what we will now have is that Jaladi will talk about in these five states where we have data and we have been monitoring for na last five years or so, using that data, she will share some highlights of uh, the topic of the day today in terms of looking at efficiency and equity in service delivery. Jaladi, over to you. Thank you, Miyamel. Uh, Rahul, next slide, please. I will briefly present the key stories related to equity, service level, and financial sustainability emerging from the performance assessment of water and sanitation services. So in last four years, PASS online system is consistently used in five states covering 850 plus cities in India. So this con consists of 20% Indian cities. Uh, the states have diverse geography and varied level of development. Gujarat and Maharashtra are being one of the most urbanized states, whereas Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh are less urbanized states. So, like in terms of population, Gujarat and Maharashtra has higher population, urban population, uh, and then followed by Telangana and Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh. Next slide, please. In access to water and sanitation services, data clearly shows success of Swachh Bharat mission. The coverage of toilet and adequate sanitation services have improved across different class uh, city sizes. So from metro city to large cities and small and medium cities. Whereas if you look at the uh, water supply services, then it's improved least in the small and medium cities, whereas it's improved much more in metro cities. So this indicates, so if under Jal Jeevan mission, which talks about tap water connection in each and every household, then to achieve this objective needs special attention in small and medium cities. Next slide, please. To achieve equitable water and sanitation services, you cannot need a special focus in the slum areas. Slum settlements have informal nature. They have uh, various issues in land tenureship. So sometimes it's difficult to uh, get individual water supply connections in slum area. So to achieve universal access, cities need to focus much more in slum area. If we look at the data sets, then it clearly indicates slums areas have 
lower individual water supply connection as compared to the city level values but good part is over over time this gap is decreasing in last four years the increase in individual water supply connection in slum is much more as compared to the city level values so we can say over a period uh, we can achieve a city, indian cities can achieve a equitable water and sanitation services so there is a disparity within uh, within states so some states have lower disparity where some states have higher uh, disparity in service provision but so under jal jeevan mission need to special focus on uh, provision of services in indian in slum areas next slide so one side you have provided a tap connection but whether the water is available in the tap or not so we have tried to map out the water supply quantity of water supplied at the consumer end so we can see many cities are majorly metro cities and large and smaller cities are providing good uh, more than 100 lpcd liter per capita per day water to the consumers but if you look at the small and medium cities then many are providing less than 70 lpcd and 10% of cities are even not providing 40 liter per capita per day so the objective of jal jeevan mission which talks about minimum 40 liter per connection per day water to the consumer so that will be a challenging task for some small and medium cities where water is not available or not managed efficiently next slide everyone knows about the zero day in cape town or in india like last year like chennai is moving so there is no water today in the tap but data sets shows many indian cities they are not supplying water daily to the consumer so one third of cities are not supplying daily water but people have a storage tank at their house they store the water and then they use it on the non supply day in terms of uh, hours of supply most cities are in the, uh, only supplying average 2 to 4 hours of uh, water supply per day so there are some pilots of 24 by 7 water supply so in for example nagpur or amravati or hubli dharwad but these are only a pilot areas only one city which is a malkapur nagar panchayat it's entirely sub supplies 24 by 7 to all citizens next slide and when we say okay we are supplying this much quantity but whether you are measuring this quantity reliably or not many times we have feel that most state many states have don't have a water meters at the consumer end if you look at this slide then you can see like at the consumer and gujarat telangana jharkhand chatisgarh the values are very less less than 10 numbers even many we talked about the consumer but the bulk supply so treatment plant distribution stations so even there also water flow meters are not installed so i think cities need to when they are providing pipe connections cities need to start monitoring the quantity of water supply at various levels so whether like from source treatment plant or distribution station how much quantity of water is supplied and even they can also monitor the water losses and inefficiency in the water supply services without meters it's city uh, officers cannot measure the inefficiency in the water supply services so metering is required in water supply services and maharashtra has a highest in terms of extent to meters has a highest metering as compared to other uh, states in india next now the financial sustainability so one side we say we don't have a meter so we charge a lump sum amount it's a fixed water charges per tap connections so like 
it ranges from 20 rupees per year to the 9600 rupees per year so of course various size of cities it ranges even within uh, of course various different states it uh, varies so maharashtra has a highest expenditure in terms of water supply uh, services but the the income is also a higher so you can see the cost recovery in water supply services so gujarat and maharashtra has higher cost recovery as compared to other states and uh, and if you look at the uh, break up of expenditure then around 80% expenditure is on staff electricity and bulk water charges only like 11% expenditure is in repair and maintenance activities which indicates like city does a breakdown maintenance so when pump stop at that time only they repair and replace it otherwise they don't do a preventive measurements so asset management preventive maintenance activities so these are not a regular practice so cities need to think for reducing the expenditure they need to move towards a preventive maintenance asset management and then also simultaneously they can think for the tariff revision so this are broad overview of uh, equity service level and financial sustainability in this state next slide please while working with cities for performance assessment for for their self assessment we also came across various uh, leading practices where the malkapur one city which provides 24 by 7 water supply services since 2010 to entire population uh, in the municipal boundary then navi mumbai city navi mumbai corporation in maharashtra so most cities have a citizen e governance system for citizen centric services but that 30% to 40% expenditure in water and Uh, sanitation services there is no e governance system for monitoring regular operation and maintenance system navi mumbai has developed a e governance system for water and sanitation service operation then we have a case of surat where city have started to mapping the leakages they prepared a leak map they set up a nrw cell they regularly does a meeting they check the leakiest area they replace the pipe so they have managed to reduce the nrw they also uh, install a tertiary treatment plant for wastewater reuse and then that wastewater is reused for the industrial purposes and the cost recovery water supply cost recovery is more than 100% because they have used the renewable energy for water supply plus they have reduced the expenditure by reducing the nrw then we have a vyan cinder which provides a scheduled septic tank emptying services as a services not as from the demand so if your tank is full then only you need to empty instead of that mindset like regular services every once in every 3 to 4 years septic tank will be cleaned regularly by the city government and then they have set up a treatment plant for septic emptying then we have a large court which real time monitors the water quantity and do a water audit in every one hour interval then we have a case of nausai where the they have uh, revitalized the lake for water supply and city beautification so this is just a glimpse of some of the leading practices but more information is available on the pass website you you can go to the pas.org.in for more information and more resources related to water and sanitation services thank you thank you thank you jaladi for the interesting presentation meera and jaladi and i although uh, we've been working on it and i can understand that there is so much to share but we are uh, given the shortage of time we can only share this much and 
I think as you rightly said, the pas.org.in website can provide more detail. What we want to get back to is some interesting uh, to our panelists uh, to reflect on this. And I'm going to call on Dr. Elena Allegre first to reflect on this. Now, Elena is the director of hydraulics and environmental engineering at the, I think it's a Portuguese name, but if I can uh, translate it properly, it's the National Civil Engineering Laboratory of the government of Portugal. And she's right. been, she has been in the field for uh, many years. As uh, Mira was saying in her initial remarks that she is the mentor for anybody who has attempted to work on performance assessment. Her uh, book that she did at the IWA, I think 15, 20 years ago on performance assessment of water is one of the benchmark for all benchmarking studies. And uh, so Elena, I think uh, a quick question to you is that since you pioneered that work at the IWA 20 years ago. And now you've seen what uh, we have done, uh, Mira's and Jaladi's presentations, uh, what we have done. And uh, so what are the key lessons that, and you have seen it happening all over the world. So what are the two or three key lessons that you have for people who are involved with this performance assessment? And what would you like to us or everybody to do more? Over to you, Elena. Yeah. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity of um, uh, participating participating in this in this event. In fact, I work with performance assessment since 1986. So I'm really working for a long time. And the IWA initiative started to was launched in the 1997. It's really impressive the evolution uh, due, uh, during the course of these 20 years. Um, if if we go now, as you very correctly said, Danish, uh, we can see all over the world people um, uh, applying performance assessment uh, in um, in the field of water and sanitation services. That was not the case. By no means, it was the case back in um, when we started. We were seen, um, well, I may say, as a kind of aliens when we were saying that we would like to work internationally in the development of a, a performance assessment system. People looked at us and said, "What are you talking about? We cannot understand what they're talking about. Are you crazy? This is not feasible. What is this this for?" So it's really impressive the evolution over time. You may ask. What may be the what we would we do or would I do differently if I if if I might start again if I were back again in 1997 uh, uh, if I would do something different I think that um, uh, our so the IWA system started by having um, a, a limited scope but that was our decision this was a huge task. Uh, and so we decided that we're not going to cover all the situations. We we started with a limited scope and this limited scope was to develop a, a performance indicator system for utilities, knowing that many services are not managed by utilities are much more informal. So we didn't we didn't cover that non formal services. We concentrated on, on the utilities and we concentrated more on the technical sides of, of the service. So we didn't include uh, issues that uh, we know, we all recognize that are very important, such as legal aspects, social aspects, um, governance aspects. So we didn't cover uh, the assessment of this type of aspects that we recognize they are important, but we had to start somewhere. So I think that if I were going to start again, I would repeat keeping the scope limited, but maybe we might have made more clear this issue that we were starting with the limited scope, but aiming at setting up the scene 
defining how to think of a performance indicator system, how to develop a performance indicator system, what are the bases, um, and well, open the floor for for other views, other perspectives uh, that we end up seeing all over the world. So I'm really impressed. Who I have had the opportunity uh, of um, following the work uh, that you have done over the years, and it's really impressive. Uh, congratulations to, to 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 the work that has been done. Um, and uh, and I I fully agree that uh, it's uh, this work is important to for to 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 be the ground to be the foundation for uh, policy for defining strategies for students for consultants for the utilities to have a better management. No doubt this is the this is the case, and this this needs to be customized to the reality, to the context we are working with. So the IWA system sets up the basics, the concepts, and provides uh, a broad number of indicators, but basically has some guidelines to build your own performance indicator system, taking into account your own objectives and context and reality. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. That was a short and crisp answer, but also a lot of wisdom there for us to want to shift to a totally different kind of a uh, issue in the context of equity for water services. And we want to go over to Jay Bhagwan from South Africa. Now, Jay, again, like Elena, old colleague, friend with whom we have been associated. And incidentally, when Elena, Elena also vis has visited SEPT and our center, Jay, Alejandro, everybody has been a visitor and uh, associated with our center for long. I had missed that out in the introduction for the webinar. Jay runs the, I mean, he's at the South Africa uh, Water Research Commission. He is looking at particularly water resource and wastewater management. He has been involved again, like Elena, with the IWA, but more recently, I think the World Toilet Organization, where he has been, and the world, what the WW, what is the other? Uh, the, Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative and many other international organizations. We have been interacting with Jay much more on the wastewater, but today I want to ask him a question that we all want to know about is the whole notion of guaranteeing the right to water in the South Africa Constitution and uh, the free basic water. That was done, I think, 20 years ago when the country became, you know, I would say independent from the earlier regime. And so, Jay, how has that panned out? Has that policy of guaranteeing water to all, has it succeeded? And have we really achieved the equity that we are all striving to achieve in the rest of the part of the world? Jay, over to you. So, so thank you very much. I think uh, in the same league around efficiency, and uh, you know, uh, let me touch a little bit on the history of South Africa. Uh, many people know the apartheid era, uh, uh, disenfranchisement, enfranchisement of people, etc. Okay, so a large population were really marginalised. You know pre-democracy, okay? And, and, and that meant that many people do not get access to water and they uh, lived on the fringes of this first world cities in South Africa. I mean, uh, Durban had a very small jurisdiction. It could have been compared to Rome or Perth or anything, uh, you know, uh, first world infrastructure, etc. Now, you know, in the democratic environment, a lot of these jurisdictions were incorporated. 
and, and I think something very unique about the South African constitution is that, uh, you know, we had the opportunity to set our constitution on a rights based platform. OK, and, and it, it was very unique in the world. So it gave, uh, you know, rights to uh, citizens to do to, to many of the basic things like health, education, uh, water, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you name it. It's, it's sort of uh, the underlying principle around was guaranteeing that right. Now, coming into, you know, uh, you know, post the apartheid, etc. Many of these cities had challenges, and I'm going to talk specifically about Durban because they've, uh, in a way, pioneered a lot of this uh, that uh, you know got uh, implemented at national level. So Durban is very unique from other big metros in South Africa, in the sense that uh, uh, they have a mix of spatial settlement uh, uh, arrangements. You know, they have a rural component. They have a, a very big rural component. They have a, a very big peri-urban settlement component, and then they have the, the more formalized part of the city. Whereas cities like Cape Town is a, is a very formalized city and a lot of wine farms around it. So uh, people think Cape Town is a big challenge. No, uh, and same with Johannesburg. It's a big city with a whole lot of gold mines around it. Uh, you know, nothing more complicated than that. So Durban, uh, when it inherited this new dispensation, uh, realized that you know the you you cannot service poor people you know efficiently if you keep having a very colonial mindset. Basically, you know you 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 think you're doing it by piecemeal. You know you you think you're doing a favor to people, etc. So they dug into the trenches to say that look, if they wanted to change, uh, you know the whole. Uh, notion of providing equitable services, they had to be innovative and creative. OK, and and by being inclusive uh, with the dichotomy that they inherited uh, and, and find innovative ways, they could have built a customer base that would then drive the efficiency of services in a very, very uh, what you say non uniform uh, environment. And that's that's one of the tensions and I'll talk to you about uh, you know, sometimes my own reflection is that, uh, you know, we took this non-uniform approach and, uh, you know, sometimes I think we might have made a mistake. But, you know, uh, with this background, this constitutional mandate, uh, we were able to shape uh, our own water legislation uh, to give a lot of effect to this issue of the right to water. OK, of course, there's a lot of vagar vagarism in some of the things etc whether it's right to access or right to quantity or etc but that allowed uh, you know at that time Durban to model you know their population segments and 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 work out uh, you know the, the financial uh, mechanics around uh, you know determining what it would cost them to provide services okay to this unserved community to a level and, and several levels. So they did those modeling exercises and they found that, look, the uh, the financial statements could support uh, through subsidy and through national transfers. Uh, uh, what we call a free basic service for the poor. OK, and it had a two pronged approach. One is that it was designed to bring in a customer. OK, so that somebody got into a formal service environment so you could drive efficiency and not just throw a standpipe there and say, you know, collect it. We don't care, you know, you know what we call that, you know, poor people become invisible. You know, it wasn't that kind of approach. So that was the one intention is to create a customer uh, against all the odds in it. And, and the second thing is to uh, ensure that they uh, sort of casted a net amongst the poor that uh, could not fall through those gaps in, in terms of poverty and, and, and you know, continue to remain in poverty. OK, so if that was in 1998, etc. The modeling was exciting. The fiscus was nice and healthy. Uh, and uh, we were able to then using the WHO uh, guidelines uh, offer, uh, you know, 
did, and Durban's got many awards for the three different levels of service. And, and the first level of service being a free basic service, uh, that was a, a yard tank uh, that was non-pressurized on your property. And then as you moved up your customer rating, you could get a higher level of service to full, full pressure system like everyone else, but your tariff and your other things. So the first, the first level was made available free, six kiloliters per family per month, which equated to the WHO recommendations of 25 liters per person per day. And we uh, sort of worked it on a, a household of five uh, on an average. So that was, uh, you know, uh, Durban experimented with it and they brought a lot of technology to it. Not very sophisticated, you know, some really practical user friendly, but also bringing the and harnessing the capacity of communities and community enterprises from the ground to, to make this happen. So they demonstrated at a city level that this was possible. And, and that was then taken up into a policy environment. And also now uh, the free basic policy was adopted and that uh, sort of led to the free basic sanitation and free basic electricity. So the basket of services now are offered freely uh, to the, now the question of services. I mean, if we had uh, done this invisible kind of approach of saying that's a poor community, that's a slum, stick a couple of standpipes and walk away. We'd come back 10 years later and the problem will still be the same. There will be slums, okay? What has happened is that the cities have evolved now. These settlements have evolved. Uh, people have uh, grown, uh, what you would say, uh, economically and healthy wise, and they're becoming economically active. How successful would it? Yep, so Durban's now moved this to, uh, you know, offering uh, 12 kiloliters free. Yeah, so they're offering 12 kiloliters free. Uh, is that me? Uh, sorry, uh, just cut me off when you have to cut me. So they I will. I I do want to want you to complete it soon, please, Jay. Okay. Yeah. So they're offering 12 kiloliters, but uh, you know they had to transition about four years ago because uh, the, the 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 spatial pattern started to change. We started to get a lot of exodus of uh, migrants, illegal migrants from you know other war-torn countries around us, but we also getting a lot of what we call climate refugees coming in from the rural areas, etc. So that has uh, had a huge explosion on this component of it. So they now uh, and, and of course, you know, people then start exploiting that situation. So people uh, would move to where the services are free. You can build beautiful houses, but they have free services. So, so they now target the subsidy to what we call indigent and there's ways they, they calculate to do that. But overall, it's brought uh, that uh, norm of efficiency in providing services in a very, what you would call dichotomy uh, scenario that all of us face in the developing world. And, and, and I think that's a good lesson. Uh, I'm not saying it's all uh, successful. There's lots of hard lessons and there's lots of flaws but it's it's a good lesson to learn from. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I think I as I said, like Elena, you also have so such a rich experience and South Africa. I think you have such a uh, path breaking free basic water. I don't think and uh, maybe at some stage we will talk about our own city of Delhi experimenting with that and I don't know if Ruchika, who lives and benefits from that, want to allude to that. But let me get back to Ruchika, uh, and uh, we want her to talk about the work that they are doing. Maybe not as uh, great as South Africa is attempting, but in the state of Odisha, one of the, I would say, less developed part of the country. But where, how do we reach out? reach water out to many others. And I think that state has set the tone for the national program of Jal Jeevan mission that Jaladi and Meera alluded to. So Ruchika, uh, in this group of engineers, 
exploding mm -hmm. Meera is another social scientist who is into the development sector and she is the country coordinator for the IRC based out in Hague, Netherlands and uh, IRC has offices all over and Ruchika handles the programs of IRC in India and Ruchika over to you talk about your Odisha and maybe Delhi if you want to <laughs> but okay yeah thank you Dinesh ji um, I stay in Noida that falls under in UP so unfortunately I don't actually benefit from uh, the yeah, from the free water, I think it's uh, 20 k, uh, 20,000 uh, liters per uh, per person for a whole month. Yeah, yeah. So, Orissa, we've been mostly working in India on rural, but um, this has been a very interesting experience for us. Uh, we are working in the state of Orissa on um, urban water with the uh, Department of uh, Urban Development along with UNICEF. So, uh, Urissa, even prior to the Jal Jeevan mission that you mentioned, uh, Dinesh ji, started with uh, the Basuda uh, program to bring pipe water supply to each household, urban or rural, in 2016-17. So, they started looking at this much before even the national government came up with the Jal Jeevan mission. Um, post that, in last year, in 2019-20, um, the Department of Urban Development, the principal secretary uh, initiated a new program on a pilot uh, basis uh, to provide 24 by 7 uh, water supply in the capital city of Bhuvneshwar and uh, the tourist city of uh, Puri, which is hit very often by cyclones. So uh, these two locations have pilot sites for 24 by 7 water. This was initiated last year, so certain uh, pilot areas have been taken. Um, the idea is to provide quality water, safe drinking water, um, and 100% of these connections are metered, and there is a whole community engagement uh, bit of it in that. Um, out of all the pilot sites, about 20% are all low-income communities. So that's very interesting because they wanted to take learnings from government areas, from uh, other residential, commercial, and from low-income communities. They wanted to take that in in the pilot phase to further build, uh, look at how uh, scaling that up would mean. So I think that has been very interesting and in how they've actually worked around it. Uh, in both Bhubaneswar and Puri, there are uh, these low income communities which are absolutely kacha and um, they, they have temporary housing, whereas they, the, the parastatal body and the, the utility have been able to actually reach to each of these households and so if it's in a compact uh, place they've provided one connection for two three households but wherever possible they've uh, at least provided one connection to each and they've adapted very appropriately and in a very timely manner to provide these so trying to make sure that there's you know small innovations in terms of having a concrete lab to make sure the pipe can go in and the tap can come out because earlier there were was a lot of leakage so there are small small innovations that have been coming out in that uh, way um the community engagement bit is fairly interesting because they have sag members uh, from uh, their uh, state level uh, sag federation who were interested in working on water trained on uh, engaging on uh, the gen, uh, sorry the uh, drink from tap mission and these uh, SAG members essentially work on connections uh, working uh, with the communities in terms of them understanding what is this whole program about how is this water different how do you ensure that you manage the water properly to ensure you don't contaminate it further um, what are the meters for and how is the billing done and providing the billing and collection of uh, resources. It's also important that they're not only doing, it's not a one-way communication, they also, uh, they provide the feedback back uh, to Wadco and uh, the engineers around, you know, there are issues that have come out with respect to uh, not being able to play at a monthly or a quarterly basis, so micro payments for that. So those kind of feedbacks have actually worked very well and wherever there have been challenges or houses left out or families that have come in, they have been able to kind of uh, flag that up and uh, provide those connections. So yeah, mostly, so this is a 
the program which is fairly new and we are in the process of uh, working with the uh, Watco on that. So I think there will be more that will develop uh, over a period of time. The pilot implementation will come uh, to an end by the end of September and uh, through the whole uh, COVID uh, pandemic process uh, uh, time, uh, while the software with the community engagement has uh, you know, lost momentum a little bit during this time, but the implementation goes on. So by uh, March, they had covered about 30,000 households and have uh, increased that number uh, significantly now. Also, they've scaled up to the whole of Puri instead of a few pockets in Puri. So that's also fairly interesting. What we are also very keen on is while these pilots are there, how to ensure that they are able to scale up and they're able to be sustainable. I think that is a challenge that uh, we want to work on much more closely with what go on. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Very interesting. And uh, since you mentioned COVID, it takes me to our uh, uh, next panelist who has done extensive work on looking at how various water utilities all over the world have responded to the challenge of COVID. And we turn to Dr. Alejandro Jimenez. Uh, he is the director of water sanitation at the CV, the Stockholm International Water Institute. Everybody knows CV as the agency that does the World Water Week every year in Stockholm. But I think they do much more than the World Water Week. And people like Alejandro work on a range of research projects. And he's been doing work on water governance with UNICEF and UNDP. And so over to you, Alejandro, to talk about your work on how cities have utilities have responded to this challenge. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dinesh. Uh, a pleasure to be here. If you can't hear me, please uh, let me know. Um, uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting us uh, to this very interesting event. And uh, yeah, as, as you were saying, we we at see we uh, had been extensively looking at the COVID response from the water perspective uh, during the last uh, few months. And actually what came to, to, to our attention is when, when the pandemic started to, to spread, as, as you know, it came, uh, started first in China and uh, surrounding countries, but then it came to Europe. We started seeing then the, the confinement measures and uh, when uh, the pandemic then uh, jumped to other areas of the world, then uh, it was very clear to us that uh, people under confinement uh, situation could have serious problems of uh, fulfilling basic needs, particularly when um, hand washing was the key message that had been uh, promoted uh, over time, right? So what we did was trying to understand what could uh, countries be doing to respond to to the pandemic uh, from the water perspective and uh, developed uh, started to look at what had been happening in different countries consulting stakeholders and developing uh, some kind of framework uh, of key key areas key activities that could be put in place to to, to alleviate the problems of, of the COVID pandemic from, from the WASH perspective. So uh, we initially developed a, a, a matrix of around 40 something activities, kind of a, of a pass, <laughs> of a performance assessment kind of. So looking at then at this time, uh, what would the countries be doing? And it was not only the water utilities, but also of course, uh, governments, subnational governments, and even uh, civil society and others, because uh, sometimes we have also found that uh, and not only the government had been doing very relevant things in terms of, of, the, of the response. So over time and with the support of UNICEF, 
we have uh, we had mapped the response of around 85 countries in the in the world and uh, i would like to say that uh, in how we were looking at this problem we were looking at two sides one was the people so what would be the the consumers from the perspective of the consumers what are actions that should be taken on the other end the service providers so how can we uh, support the service providers because these are two sides of the same of the same coin and uh, i'm sure you all have been seeing that uh, um, the if if not both aspects both sides are taken into consideration we might run into a sustainability problem very quickly um, so what we we saw in terms of, of the consumers, the key areas to, to look at were certainly what was happening in terms of hand washing campaigns, awareness campaigns, um, and other than IPC measures. And then also, of course, what were the, the aspects being put in place so that people could have access to water and sanitation if they were uh, confined. That means uh, all these aspects related to uh, to waiving the payments, uh, providing free water for a few months uh, for some uh, at some strata in the population or sometimes for everyone, um, delivering uh, water through extraordinary means for people that were not connected, uh, etc. Right? Um, then uh, the aspects of the water utilities, what we were looking at and the service providers were okay, how two, two main aspects. First, how the service providers are able to keep continuity of the service under these circumstances, because uh, they also had restrictions in mobility, uh, staff might be sick, uh, you might have problems with, with uh, chlorine and other supplies, etc. right? So how the water utilities were keeping the operations uh, going as well as providing extraordinary services, as I was saying. And on the other end, what is the technical and financial support provided to these utilities, right? Because as if on one end you provide free water, but on the other end uh, there is no not a mechanism to to support the water utilities to to cope with with that loss of income. Uh, sooner or later, there would be an important problem in the financial uh, sustainability of, of these services. So we were looking at this whole range of things and uh, in general uh, what we could see is that uh, at the first uh, stages of the pandemic the governments were more uh, I, I think naturally looking at the uh, short-term measures of uh, ensuring that to the extent uh, well, with different degrees of success, but trying to ensure that people would have access to services even if in, if confined. So those aspects of uh, putting free water or reconnecting people, even if they hadn't, I mean, if they were had been disconnected before, or doing extra connections free of cost, etc., had been uh, much uh, so much employed through the different countries. Uh, and water utilities. I think the water utilities were in general doing extraordinary efforts to, to deliver water, water tracking, um, yeah, imaginative uh, solution sometimes, and uh, a lot of uh, workers in the water and sanitation sector had been active during the hard times of, of the pandemic, right? Um, what we saw much less is uh, the attention to sanitation, even if uh, many people rely on, on public toilets. So, uh, of course, these public toilets uh, need to be used as well if you don't have any toilet at, at home, even during confinement. So those were perhaps uh, neglected as well as to some extent public places in general, and sanitation in public places, uh, uh, including health centers, right? So just to say that uh, this this part had been much less, much less covered. Also, the measures were often mostly dedicated to the big urban centers and uh, 
not always designed to, to reach the rural areas or it always took longer to, to reach a smaller, medium cities and, and rural areas. The capacities are not the same, but uh, still people were in, in many occasions under the same confinement uh, measures. Also, I would say that uh, there had been limited uh, gender sensitivity in the measures and trying to, to look at the specific needs of uh, women and girls in this situation, which uh, at least we wouldn't, we weren't able to, to see much of that. Um, and uh, certainly what we, we saw is very limited financial and technical support to, to the service providers, right? So while this, um, this uh, aspect of waiving payments and so on were, were happening, not at the same time this, this has been mirrored with how are we going to support the service provision. So some countries are looking at that now, I think, from the start of the pandemic, uh, we all thought this would be shorter, um, and uh, and it's not. So I think some measures were in place for three months now, like uh, waiving of payments and so on. Uh, but then, then now are extended another three months, probably another three months, and uh, and countries are suffering also from uh, serious economic crisis. So there is a, a big challenge in, in uh, how to, to keep this balance from one end, protecting the, the, the consumers from other end, uh, keeping service running. And just the last point is that, uh, of course, informal areas, and that links to some of the aspects that have been addressed, are, uh, have been uh, more difficult to reach and uh, with the measures perhaps due to the informality itself, how the, the governments are uh, able to operate there. But then, of course, uh, there has been a lot of uh, civil society uh, initiatives and others that have helped to, to bridge the gap. But certainly there is a, a, there should be an area of attention, which is not surprising given that, uh, of course, the, the initial conditions are uh, has been raised in, in a couple of presentations are certainly not uh, optimal and and that would then uh, exacerbate the the problems under under this covid so just to say that uh, yeah we we see that uh, the in general there, there had been good steps and improvements in many countries but uh, what we are we see as some concerns are how are we going to maintain this over time? How are we going to complete, let's say, the response uh, so that uh, this can benefit or people can have access to, to services under these very difficult circumstances? I stop there and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. OK, thank you, Alejandro. What uh, we just before we move to the question and answer uh, because we are the panelists have uh, our original plan was to do two rounds but i think we are running out of time so may i just request panelists uh, to quickly reflect back on this or something else that you want to say maybe take a minute minute and a half we will start with elena Elena, any reflections on what you have heard? Yes, um, one, I'd like to focus on this issue of equity that, as I told, was not so much dealt with in, um, in the IWA performance indicator system, but this is something that I consider to be really fundamental. When we talk about equity, there are several dimensions of equity. One dimension that is not so much addressed, at least so frequently, is the time equity, is intergenerational equity. We cannot put into risk the coming generations. So our decisions now, when we are talking about investments in new systems, expanding systems or whatever, we cannot forget that these systems have a um, whole of life cost that needs to be addressed and not only the first investment, and then whatever we decide, as we're talking about assets that have long lives, 
that we need to think over time. We need to have this mindset, especially if we are short in, in resources, we need really to have this long-term view of our investments, of our decisions. So asset management, infrastructure asset management is really critical, is a critical dimension of equity that sometimes is um, uh, underlooked. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Elena. I, I think. Can I jump to that, uh, uh, Dinesh, if I may? Because. Uh, sure, actually, sure. Okay. Can we? Uh, yeah, Alejandro, please, please reflect back. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you, because uh, Elena raised a, a, a very important point, and actually what we are seeing linked to, to, to this scarcity of resources in the water utilities is that uh, many are probably starting to use the, the funds that they had allocated for investments to cover for, for this shortage of resources that, that they are having in yeah, in uh, lower income because lower consumption, lower payments and so on. So actually this is going to be a very uh, direct consequence of, right. of, uh, of uh, this lack of, of income because they don't have other sources. So just to, to reiterate that it's a real risk under, under these circumstances. Thank you, Elena, for raising that. Great. Uh, Mira, you want to say some? Uh, sorry, Ruchika first, and then I'll go to Mira. Ruchika? Yeah, yeah thank you. I think I'll just build upon uh, Helena's point again um, in terms of uh, equity. Um, I think till we don't uh, look in the long term in terms of visioning and planning for long term uh, uh, development of cities, it, it always is a problem because in the case of India, we're jumping from one program of uh, to another, uh, you know, looking at Swaj Bharat Mission and then it ends to another. Whereas a uh, planning for sanitation, we have city sanitation plans, but unfortunately they just sit on the shelves and not are not used in practice. So I and when it comes to the urban poor, I think they get the the lowest uh, service options of uh, community toilets or uh, public toilets as an option when it comes to planning for them. So I think um, one is in terms of long term visioning and planning uh, and using tools of Amrut and Swaj Bharat Mission to uh, fill in those uh, plans. And the other thing is to have capacities on ground of the ULBs to be able to do this, to be able to have asset management systems, to be able to plan like this, to have coordination between the different departments because Often uh, we see the you know the lack of coordination uh, in uh, urban poor localities uh, because Unmute. yeah 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 so just to state one quick example uh, in the case of uh, Udaipur there was uh, an urban slum and they had put in pipe water supply with meters and within a month uh, the road. Uh, the road construction was done, which broke it all. So not only you're not looking at services for them, but you're also looking at huge wasted um, investments. So, yeah. May I just uh, make a short comment <laughs> on the Go call. ahead, go ahead. So um, I, I think it's quite um, obvious uh, that there are room for much better policy maker, uh, po policies with that regard. So regulators have a major role to play in terms of uh, enabling asset management in the regions and policy makers as well. So there are many different uh, incentives that may be put in place relatively easy to, to promote this, long, this longer term uh, perspective. Within uh, ISO, the standardization committee, we are now developing a guidance standard in order to, to, to develop the key building blocks for uh, to enable asset management uh, implementation in, in the regions and, and, and countries. So there are many good examples and uh, I think it's really critical for the, 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 the future to have uh, uh, this, this issue duly addressed. Yeah. OK, thank you, Elena. And I think this is very interesting to see the interaction among the panelists. My uh, Jay, you have your one minute. Any last remark?
you need to unmute. Mm -hmm. Saying is that uh, the COVID-19 and uh, the, the droughts that we've seen recently in many parts of the world have opened up a lot of fault lines around our approach, you know, to water services delivery, especially from an efficiency. I mean, we've been driving a revenue based model rather than an equity based model. And, and just to keep it short, where there's no equity, there is no efficiency. OK, and then and, and keep that in mind because uh, if you can't solve the equity issue, you cannot, you know, uh, solve the water services environment. Thank you very much. Sorry, one uh, last, uh, Mira, quick, quick retort. I just wanted to bring back what actually Jai said right now is very, very valid. And what Aliandro referred to in terms of access to toilets and the use of public toilets, especially during pandemic, but even otherwise for women during MHM, uh, their uh, menstrual periods, uh, those days it becomes extremely difficult for women and the elderly to use community toilets. So the emphasis on having individual household level toilets is critical. Uh, government of India, unfortunately, is emphasizing that you know there is lack, where there is lack of space, you need to go for community toilets. And we, our students, actually have done studies where women have built individual toilets in their very very small homes when they had access to credit, when they had access to finance. So this is something that I think deserves emphasis. And one needs to promote and go beyond looking at community toilets as a solution and move to individual household toilets for everybody and including in dense slums in uh, places like Mumbai and Pune. Ahmedabad has led the way in terms of providing infrastructure in slums through their slum networking program where it became possible for individual households to have not only access to toilets but also to water so i think that is probably the way to go in the future thank you thank you i am now handing over to uh, mr wara because uh, he will moderate the question answer i believe there are many questions and answers so if there are questions for panelists particular panelist or if any panelist. So I'm handing over to our moderator, Mr. Vora. Thank you. Yes. So uh, let me and I will uh, ask this questions in some, I mean, reorder them so that I combine some of the connected question. I would also request uh, uh, Dr. Meera Mehta to kind of take the questions and then uh, she can, of course, pass on to somebody if she wants to. We have a number of questions, so let us try to address most of them. Uh, so one is related to one uh, a series of questions are related to how to involve communities and what specific challenges are faced what methods approaches have worked successfully now the connected question is one related to uh, um, how significant is water theft in india and this is you know it was again linked to a question that scope for recognizing and then facilitating uh, people who had to maybe steal water by breakages in pipes and also that these are these breakages are also quite difficult to repair. So this is related to community involvement, particularly in some area. Of course, the thefts occur in rich households also, but uh, we will address the main part. That uh, so, how do you see this community involvement and what are the challenges and what has worked? And how are thefts etc. have been handled in a constructive manner so that ultimately water is available? Go ahead, yeah, to answer your question on community involvement, that is absolutely extremely critical. We generally link community involvement to only low income areas, but in fact, community involvement is necessary not only in low income areas, but throughout the city as a whole. Uh, but in low income areas, particularly involvement of communities, and I think Ruchika highlighted that very well in terms of the program that is happening in Odisha. If local households and communities are involved in creating access to both water supply as well as uh, sanitation facilities, 
it is likely that it will work much much better uh, this is easy to say and not as easy to implement so it is something that will require working with existing communities working with self help groups that are available in many areas and creating also one very important and especially for sanitation and to some extent even for water supplies creating access to uh, credit for water and sanitation there are agencies in india that have actually focused on this aspect and creating this access to credit makes it possible for individual households to take connections for that because all there is a cost to taking individual connections to building an individual toilet and so on so that requires access to credit this is to my mind very very critical uh, there are examples that we have from maharashtra one of the cities where we work uh, city of jalna where this kind of access was created and therefore uh, women were able to build toilets on their own so those are aspects that are very important let me stop with this that regulatory aspects are very important also i think uh, elena hinted at that but in our case Maharashtra particularly has suffered. I mean, people have suffered because of the kind of cut-off dates that are there for slum areas, and therefore people are not really able to gain legitimate connections and legitimate toilets. So those are issues that will have to be addressed if we want to achieve that. Okay. So uh, the related question was that how has the instances of how people have used maybe ruchika can because the next question was for ruchika which is kind of extension that what has orissa done differently to be able to establish partnership with social organizations with communities what difference they have done compared to others and how it has succeeded and uh, if there is an example of how say thefts have been converted to legal use you can say about that also Uh, you have to unmute sorry yeah so uh, i think one of the things uh, they've done well is uh, work with the sag uh, network and that's extremely strong both in the urban and rural uh, areas the second is uh, they've looked at access to basic services and they haven't looked at land tenure for that so uh, people uh, who do not have a uh, ownership of that land still get access to water and that is one of the issues around theft so if you as it is providing safe drinking water 24 by 7 you as it is do away with that challenge so i think these end up being uh, yeah and just in terms of engaging with community on uh, water supply it is uh, generally in the development sector a lot of uh, experience has been do not start with hardware first work with community inform communities about what's coming inform them much more about the service what is it that's going to be given to them what is their responsibility will tariffs be act, uh, uh, applicable to what extent so give proper information before you start with the hardware that comes from my development sector learning that's but it becomes difficult when you work with government like uh, meera ji said it's easier said than done especially when you're working with government but that's something that we are still trying to push how can this uh, communication still go along with the implementation yeah okay i'll i'll uh, kind of take maybe 5 to 7 minutes more so because i think the questions are interesting and we will complete at least few of them uh, so there is a question on uh, you know urban cities either near i mean cities near sea or in arid places what can be best approach or technologies for water supply which is also cost effective maybe uh, dr meera mehta or dr dinesh mehta you want to take a start you to defer to defer to elena okay jay is on a coastal durban okay so is lisbon lisbon and durban yes in fact i may perhaps uh, refer that uh, in half an hour we are going to have the kick off meeting of an european project called be water smart that is enabling smart water cities uh, or, or uh, enabling smartness in coastal europe so we are starting in order to work out with the water smartness uh utilities and water services we are starting with coastal coastal cities why 
because it's it's interesting if you think that uh, normally European cities, uh, well, coastal cities, they start not because they have water, as it happens in the inner cities, but they start because they have a good location in geotetic, uh, in a um, uh, geopolitical terms, in economic terms, and so it's very common in a world that they are short of water because there are other reasons so they grew for other reasons and they tend to be short of water so there there there, there is really a challenge and uh and a driver for uh coastal cities to become smarter uh, they they need to really to work on circular economy they they have really a lot of mechanism a lot of challenges to to address because they have short normally they have short um, they, are, they are short of fresh water available locally uh, and uh, so this program this project is going to address many different dimensions from the buildings and the, the behavior of the families and the, the what you can do from the construction point of view in buildings to the risk associated to to the use of treated wastewater as an alternative water source um, uh, resource recovery so this project i would clearly um, promote well encourage you to have a look uh, to browse be water smart and keep tuned maybe stockholm has more, more to share stockholm sorry yeah um from from my side just uh building on what uh, elena was saying um not from stockholm but from from other uh work we have been done in city water resilience uh i remember one one of the cities being that where this had been uh, applied it was uh, in miami and uh, actually also to in addition to what elena raised uh the aspect of climate change can be a serious threat to to coastal cities uh, through the rise of the level of water, uh, risk of uh, floods, as well as a saline saline intrusion at the groundwater level. So that is also very very important uh, risk. So certainly, uh, coastal cities are, are really at the have to be at the forefront of uh, a smart water management circular economy and uh, and resilience thank you uh, very quickly uh, this initially your present uh, your presentation covered a bit, bit of the past covered how the data was used how the data is you know collected presented analyzed and how it's used in uh, 850 plus cities so can you just quickly cite one or two instances of data having been used to bring some creative changes uh, in providing services, facilities, and also maybe improve training of people or maintenance, operational efficiency or maintenance of facilities. Yeah. Dr. Dinesh Mehta or Dr. Mira Mehta. Yeah, no, no, I, I would, uh, I think that our efforts yeah. have, as we saw from the presentation, range of, uh, range of implication. Uh, a few cities, especially in the state where we are in Gujarat, when we presented the information, you know, when you tell cities that they have invested, uh, you know, $50 million on a water project, and then we come up and show that the connections are still the same. So the access has not improved. So then they realize that the issue is that people are not connecting because we have a higher connection charge, etc. So cities, it, it's particularly true for sewerage because they charge very high fee if you want to connect to a sewer line. So therefore, large number of cities in India have sewer lines laid out, but people are not connecting. Now, this is something that comes out from our data. So policies are then passed uh, that connection fees are reduced or they are spread all over. The other issue is that when we did some water audits, cities realized that 
uh, you know, in, in the state where we live in Gujarat, there are no water meters, neither at the consumer end, nor even at the utility end. So when we did our quick and dirty ways of doing water audits through a bucket survey and putting temporary clamp meters on the pipes, etc., we discovered that cities are very high in non-revenue water. So they have now begun to make investments. So our it is quite gratifying to see that some of these results are leading to major changes in the way in which water is managed in our cities. And so that is something that is quite useful to us. I mean, and it keeps us going. Hopefully more and more cities will follow. Yeah. Uh, one question is on the, of course, the charges issue is a tricky one that uh, it's also a question of if we don't charge an economic price and then if we charge a really economic price, then people don't use it. And if we charge economic, uh, if we don't charge an economic price, uh, then people don't, people uh, obviously overuse it and don't adopt recycling measures and also any thoughts on that or any solutions? So. The main issue is that a large proportion of our cities don't have consumer level metering. I think Viresh earlier mentioned about Gujarat, not a single city has consumer metering. Maharashtra is a little better with higher levels, but all over India, in between, we were trying to count, and not out of 4,000, not more than 100 cities have consumer level metering and even those often don't work where you don't have metering you can't have water pricing in a real sense so what we have is not uh, con the consumption link pricing but we have essentially user charges which are flat charges for water supply and in Jaladi's uh, analysis shows that cost recovery is happening through those flat charges but I think awareness amongst uh, consumers that to what extent they are consuming water and they are paying for water is not there. And therefore the recycling and things that we talk about doesn't happen to the extent that is needed. So I think consumer meters in a much larger way is the way to go in future. Without that, this will not just happen. We will have cost recovery, but we will not have efficient water use and the reuse practices that we are talking about. So that's that's our view on this. Okay. Yeah. One last interesting question, and then probably we may have to stop. Is a PAS also is PAS also looking at? I mean, has seen your data collection has seen, or and on thinking of uh, has it incentivized sort of including any other localized solutions within a to be included in a municipal system, or you have come across such you know local efforts. I mean, uh, ULB which ULB has used. The local effort by a specific community within a larger body, maybe a localized effort by a community or an area, and it has you know given good performance. So, like a local sewage treatment plants or local water recycling, whatever. And Jaladi, and you can Jaladi can. Yes, yeah, so uh, I think uh, now we are also trying to uh, link rainwater harvesting uh, systems information. So like availability of rainwater harvesting uh, services in the uh, cities. So uh, like some community specific also we will try to link into that. So whenever the need will come so we will try to uh, incorporate other aspects of performance assessment in in this past system so this is not like the fixed system but over a period of time as and when the water and sanitation supply sanitation sector needs will change we will also include other aspects in our assessment framework okay so uh, is there any other comment i mean we, so the question and answer is uh, uh, is closed and any more questions if they come they can be addressed offline later on uh, through mail uh, i'll hand over to dr dinesh mehta uh, if there are any closing comments and vote of thanks 
no, I think quickly, thank you, uh, all the panelists. First of all, thanks to the Win Foundation for inviting us to host this webinar. Thanks to all our colleagues, partners, the panelists, Elena, Alejandro, Ruchika, and Jay for readily agreeing to be on this panel and to my colleague Meera and Jaladi for the presentation. I think we've had a interesting discussions. So, I, and I, I hope that offline we will continue to do so. Uh, many of the people in the audience must have found this very interesting. So thanks to the audience as well. And thank you all. And thank you, Paresh Bhai. If you have any other closing remark, then maybe invite people to your next webinar. So. Yeah, so we just wanted to show you the announcement for the next webinar, which is uh, on next Thursday. And uh, I think Raul will just show it on the screen in a few seconds. But thank, thanks to all for staying through this, uh, attending this and staying through this session. And you see the session. So it's on 24th September again from 5.30 onwards. Uh, this is integrating the design of water, wastewater, storm water and solid waste for small towns and large villages uh, from uh, Sitara, that is Center for Technology Alternatives for Rural Areas, IIT Bombay. So we hope to see you all again. And feel free to forward this to your other colleagues, friends, if they wish to attend. Thank you again and see you next week. Thank you.